Castaway by Nelson S. Bond There was an ad in the classified columns of this week's Spaceways Weekly. It asked for information concerning the whereabouts of one Paul Moran, last known to have taken off from Long Island Spaceport for parts unlogged. Captain Neely drew this notice to my attention. He said, Look at this, Braid. Wasn't Moraine the chap we picked up in the asteroids? It seems to me I remember. You should, I told him. You see his name twice every shuttle, engraved on cold steel, and you can be thankful for that. But I don't think he'll answer this ad. I don't think they'll ever hear from him. That, scoffed the shipper, is nonsense. Do you realize what this means, Braid? This ad was inserted by the government patent office. There's a fortune waiting for Mr. Moran back on Earth when he sees this. Fortune waiting, I said softly. When and if he sees it. But I wonder, Skipper, I wonder. We were about 3,000 miles north, west, and loft of Ceres when we first sighted him. I remember that well because I was on the bridge and our sparks, Toby Frisch, had just handed me a free clearance report from the space commander of that planetoid. I read it and chuckled. I said, Sparks, this bit of a transcription is a masterpiece. Nobody expects a radio man to be good-looking or have brains, but blue space above, man, your spelling and grammar. Leave my relatives, said Sparks stiffly. Out of this. Is this message OQ or ain't it? Yes, I told him, with a light sprinkling of no. Sometimes I wish we had a good operator aboard the Antigon. Like one of those Donovan brothers, for instance. Them guys, sniffed Sparks. Too wise for their britches, both of them. I'm a bug pounder, not a joke book. If it's smart cracks you want, why don't you buy an audio? It was at this point that Lieutenant Russ Bartlett, first mate of our ship, who had been shooting the azimuth through the peri lenses, turned and waved to me excitedly. Great! Take a look! Quick! There's a man down below, on one of the minor asteroids. I said, A joke, Bartlett? You better check the alignment of those peri lenses. That's the man in the moon, you see. Gunner McCoy... Bartlett's staunchest friend and admirer, looked up from the road report, wrinkled his leathery, space-toughened cheeks into a frown, and squirted mickle juice at a distant gaboon. Maybe I'll better look, Mr. Brait, he said. If Russ says there's a man there, then there's a man there. So I looked, and to look was to act. I cut in my inner communication unit and bawled a stop hypo order to Chief Lester in the engine room below. Bartlett was right. There was a single, bulgur-clad figure sprawled on the craggy rock of a tiny asteroid hurtling itself beneath us. A man who lay there quietly, did not rise, did not wave, gave no sign of noticing our approach, even when I dropped the Antigon down toward the spatial island. Bartlett, peering through the duplicate lens, said, Dead, Brate. He must have cracked up. He's not moving. But there was no wrecked spaceship around. I said, We'll know in a few minutes. And then the skipper burst into the bridge, startled and curious. Something haywire, boys? Here, I'll take over. He was a good man, Captain McNeely. A hardened space hound. Canny and wise to the ways of the void. Always on deck in moments of emergency. That's why the IPS, the corporation for which we work, had placed him in command of the Antigon. Finest and fastest ship in the fleet. But I calmed his rotors. Everything's OQ, sir, I told him. We're standing by to take on a space-wrecked sailor, I think. Our guess was right. A few minutes later, we threw out a grapple. Space anchored the ante, and a rescue party landed on the asteroid. They brought back with them a sad-looking specimen of the genus Homo sapiens. His cheeks were drained and sunken beneath a bristled, unkept beard. His skin was blistered frightfully from long exposure to solars and cosmics. His limbs were so feeble that he couldn't walk unaided. He had to be carried. Someone unscrewed his face port for him. He drew a long, deep breath of the pure Antigon air. His waned eyes lighted dimly, and he spoke in a voice that was a thin husk of a sound. Thank you, gentlemen. I had hoped that at last I might, but you meant well, I suppose. Which was, I thought at the time, a damn strange speech of gratitude, but I had no time to answer for his knees suddenly buckled beneath him. His eyes closed. Had it not been for the friendly hands that supported him, he would have pitched forward on his face. Captain McNeely snapped, Sick bay! 
Snap it up, you lovers. This man's in bad shape. Out on his feet cold. Sparks whispered, Gosh, he looks like a corpus. As the sailors bore our unexpected passenger away, I stared at him disgustedly. Corpse, I said. Huh? said Sparks. Corpse, I repeated. Corpse. You, suggested Sparks. Ought to take something for that indigestion. Lieutenant, my sister had it. It made her a physical reek. It's against the rules for a second mate to punch a radio man, so I kicked him. There are limits. That was our first meeting with the mysterious Paul Moran. We didn't know his name then, of course. We learned that several days later. After Doc Turnigan, our medico, had coaxed, bulldozed, and sofanilamide him back off the brink of the dark and nasty. Doc was the first to tag Morgan with the adjective we all eventually accepted. It's the dangest thing, he told me. I've ever seen, right? I'll swear in a pile of prescriptions that he didn't have one chance in a million of pulling through. But he's still alive. By rights, he should have been dead two weeks before we found him. Do you know he was out on that asteroid five solid weeks? Without food, with only one container of water, with oxygen reserves in his tank practically exhausted? And his condition, Turnigan, shook his head uncomprehendingly. Deplorable. He was desiccated, undernourished, fouled from weeks in a bulger. Acute cyanosis alone should have killed him. But, I said, the will to live, Doc... It's the determining factor in many a borderline case. I've heard of men with holes in their heads you could drive a Stratos plane through with who simply refuse to. That's just it, said Jernigan. He wants to die. He refused to take food. I had to feed him intravenously and force him to drink. But in spite of his physical and mental condition, he still lives. It's mysterious, Bray. So I went in to visit our strange passenger. He wasn't a bad-looking chap, now that his whiskers had been plowed. Then, of course hollow of cheek and eye. His skin was sallow, faintly olive, the contours of his head long and narrow, short indexed. He was a typical Mediterranean, if what my profs taught me is right. Medium stature, small bone, thin, tapering fingers, crisp, oily hair, black as space. I said, well, you look like a new man, which he did. You're looking fine, I said, which he wasn't. He turned his head slowly, studied me with grave, questioning eyes. His voice was faint but low and pleasing. You are Mr. Brait, the second mate. I believe I have you to thank for rescuing me. That's all right, I told him. Why? he interrupted gently. Did you do it? I said, oh, come on now. You got to perk up. You get a little flesh on your bones and you'll feel better. But he went on as though not hearing my words. It was a chance, the best chance I've had for years, a thousand years, and you took it from me. Out there I might have found peace at last. The power cannot, it must not extend to the depths of space. His voice had risen. There was a light madness of strange, savage intensity in his eyes. I felt the little hairs on the back of my neck pringling. I knew now that the man had not come unscathed through his experience. He was space crazy. Wildly, desperately so. I said in what I hoped was a soothing voice. Now take it easy, Mr. Uh, Moran, isn't it? The ghost of a smile touched his lips, and his body became less tense. He said wearily, Moran, yes, or Adder, or Card, or anything you choose. It hardly seems important anymore. I've had so many, many names. That wasn't exactly encouraging, but at least he was quieter now and I had to know a few things about him to put in the ship's log. I asked, How did you get to that asteroid, Moran? Were you space-wrecked? If so, what's the name of your craft? The authorities will want to know. He answered almost mockingly, I was marooned. Marooned? But that's criminal. Who did it? We'll have them picked up and punished. You'll do nothing of the sort. They marooned me on that asteroid because I deserved it, and I respect and thank them for it. His voice was rising again, higher and shriller. I thank them, do you hear? I bless them a hundred thousand million times. Though their effort was in vain, I was, and I am. A Jonah. A Jonah. Jonah, Jonah. He sat bolt upright in bed, screaming the word defiantly. Doc Jernigan raced in, glanced at me reproachfully, and took his patient in hand. You'd better go, Bray, he suggested. So I left. The sweat on my forehead was damp and cold. 
I needed a drink. When I told Cap McNeely of my experience, he nodded soberly. I know, Bray. I saw him before you did. And he acted just as loony toward me. Warn me he was a... Jonah. I'm not superstitious, I, I interrupted. But there are such things as Jonah's. Men whose very presence aboard the spaceship seemed to cause trouble, dissension, disaster. Do you remember that Venetian blaster on the Goddard Three? The survivors always swore he caused the crack up. Moran's case, frowned the skipper, is more than just superstition. He told me that he never wanted to see Earth again. When I told him that was too bad, that we were headed for Earth right now, he warned me solemnly that he'd do everything in his power to prevent us getting there. So what do you think of that? I think, I said glumly. He's nuts. And if we pay any attention to him, we'll all be nuts too. Well, I've got to go, Cap. I've got to check the shield generators before we go busting into Earth's H layer. And I left. Well, I was busy for the next four days on my job. It's a plenty important job and had to be done carefully. The H layer of the planets, the Kenley Heaviside layer, it's a supertension field of force similar in composition to the corona of a star, a wide swath of ionized gas with high potential serving as a shield against the murderous Q and ultraviolet rays that emanate from solar bodies. But the H layer is a barrier as well as a shield. The first space flight experimenters learned that, and the knowledge cost them their lives, for their craft hit the H layer unguarded, and where had been a glistening ship, now was pitted black and metal, where had been life, now there was charred carbon. Now all spaceships were equipped with shield generators. They were generators by courtesy only. Actually, they were huge condensers fed by cable lines tied at intervals to the hull plates. The theory was that as the craft plunged into and through the H layer, these condensers would absorb the excess potential, thus allowing the ship to pass through unharmed. And it worked swell, most of the time. Oh, every few years a ship would get theirs, would blow out in a blue wreath of coruscate flame. But for the most part the trip was safe enough, except, of course, when a condenser was in bad condition, which is why I was giving hours a check and a double check. Still, I could never rid myself of a queasy moment when we hit that blanket of spark-happy ionization particularly when a planet was at aphelion as Earth was now, because at such times the H-layer was more highly active than usual. And to tell the truth, I wasn't satisfied with the way my work was going. First I hit my thumb with a monkey wrench. It didn't hurt the wrench, but my thumb turned pale, mauve, and throbbed like a 16-year-old kid's pulse on his first hayride. Then I lost a brass collar off the hull brace, and since we didn't carry a reserve stock, I had to ask Chief Lester to make me one, by the time that was ready, I'd busted a point forty four coal cable lock and had to jury-rig a substitute. Oh, it was a headache. But I wasn't the only guy on board the ante who was having troubles. Slops raised a howl to high heaven because his stove went on the squeegee. Gunner McCoy stalked into the officer's mess one afternoon, demanding what such-and-such and so-and-so such and -so had stripped the gears off of his pet rotor gun. Sparks burned out three vacuum tubes in one day, breaking contact with all transmitting stations, and almost causing us to crack up on a rogue asteroid. Even Cap McNeely was visited by the plague. It came wailing to me on the bridge that the refrigeration units in number three storage bin had broken down. And we've lost a whole bin full of clab, brat, worth at least 6,000 credits on Earth. Corporation will be mad as hell. That's tough, I said, but there's nothing we can do about it. It wasn't your fault. He eyed me curiously. Great, he said. Yes, Cap, I've been wondering. Do you think there could be anything in what Moran said about him being a Jonah? I've been thinking the same thing myself. I don't know, Skipper. I wouldn't say yes, and I wouldn't say no. But there's no doubt about it. Things have been going haywire ever since we picked him up. I'll be glad when he lifts Graves off the ante. Cap said grumpily. Of course it's just nonsense. Bad luck doesn't hang around one man like that. It's against the law of averages. Still, I wish you'd sort of keep an eye on him for the next three days, break. Till we land on Earth. I've got a notion. So is Earth, I grinned. Five of them. Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and two etceteras. What's yours? It might, frowned the skipper. Be sabotage. He said he'd do everything in his power to prevent our reaching Earth, and he's up and around now. If you think that, I suggested, why don't you just shove him in the cling, just to make sure? Can't do it, because I've no proof he's responsible for these occurrences. And besides, a rescued passenger is entitled to the courtesy of the ship. So that's how I assumed, in addition to the rest of my duties, the job of watchdogging this mysterious Paul Moran. 
As Cap McNeely had said, Moran was up and about now. He made what Doc Jornigan claimed was the swiftest recovery in the annals of medicine. He still looked like a skeleton in search of a square meal, but there was sanity in his eyes, if not always in his speech. Like that afternoon in Sparks Radio Turn, for instance. We had been talking, Sparks and I, about spaceflight. What a great thing it was, how only in its infancy it had already changed man's outlook, widening the borders of man's domain, creating a newer, greater universe. We've got, Sparks said, reason to be proud of ourselves. Gee, I was reading in the library. You, I interrupted wonderingly, can read? Comments to you, Lieutenant, sniffled Sparks. As I was saying before, I was so rudely ruptured. I was reading in the library some old books from the 20th century. Just about 150 years old, mind you. They had the craziest ideas about what men would find on other planets if and when we ever got there. Flaming men, robots, all sorts of things. Nothing like what we actually found. Of course, we shouldn't laugh at them too much. They had no way of knowing. We're the first people to have ever traveled in space. No, said Moran. Sparks said patiently. Well, I didn't mean us here in this room, of course. We ain't, but I mean all the people of our time. And I still say, said Moran gravely, no, man in all ages is a creature of conceit, self-pride, self-glorification. There was space flight long before you lived, Sparks, a race long dead now from a neighboring planet. I said gently, you're thinking of those pyramids found on Venus and Mars, Moran. I know that's a puzzler for modern science, and I've read several theories regarding their builders, but most authorities agree that their mere presence does not necessarily imply the existence of a single race of engineers. Pyramid is a fundamental structure form. Any intelligent race. Man, said Moran almost sadly. Man the dreamer, man the doubter. No, Lieutenant, I'm not speaking of theories now. I'm speaking of tales I've heard, accounts I've read in archives long molded into dust. And at least three times in the past of civilizations raced the span of the void. It was the dying Martian race that first achieved space flight. They found Venus a rank and stinky jungle. But on Earth, certain of them set up their new abode. He smiled quietly and reverted to savagery, as is always the case when civilized man, removed from the source of his culture, find themselves face to face with stark reality. Then it was the moon creatures who fled their airless world, spanned the distance to nearby Earth. I said, that's an interesting thought, Moran. It explains the coloration of the races of man, doesn't it? I'd like to read that book you mentioned. Where can I get it? He shook his head sadly. You can't, Lieutenant Brat. The last copy of it was destroyed more than twelve centuries ago. Simon Magnus was the last man to read it, as I remember. I loaned it to him. He stopped abruptly, but Sparks' eyes were plate-sized and incredulous. You loaned it to him? I spun on Sparks, angry. Jernigan had told us to humor Moran, help him to complete recovery. I didn't approve of this, not a little bit. I snapped. That'll do, Sparks. Good Lord, man. What's the matter, Moran? For suddenly his face had paled, his eyes widened in horror, then he was backing away from me. He thrust out a trembling hand, grasped hoarsely. Have a care, Brate. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Then he fled, his running footsteps clattering down the ramp. The echoes were strangely disturbing. Sparks stared after him, then made a circular motion at his temple. Nusty said, Crazy as a loon, Lieutenant. Oh, he was an odd one, that Moran. Those next days are somehow garbled in my mind. They were so full of incident, and now, looking back upon them, I can hardly distinguish between that which actually was and that which was an active imagination conjured for me out of fantasy. This I do know. It was the worst trip I've ever experienced in the Antigon, or any other ship. Something was always wrong. Lieutenant Russ Bartlett, whose mind is as accurate as the cogs of a computing machine, discovered to his dismay that he had made an error in calculation that at our present rate of speed, we would miss Earth entirely and plunge sunward at a rate that would destroy us all. He discovered that by sheer accident and just in time to scream a hasty, Cut hypos! to the engine room, else I wouldn't be here at all to tell it. Then there was that mysterious occurrence in the galley. Our cook had a pet cat, and if it weren't for his habit of feeding the pussy before he fed the crew, half of us would be stiff now, because that cat slopped up its dinner and forthwith proceeded to give up all nine of its lives simultaneously. Tomain, from faulty food tins. This was the first time such a thing had happened in more than forty years. You couldn't say Moran was behind either of these near disasters, for I was dogging his footsteps. I'll take my oath. He was not involved. Physically, that is. 
But they say a Jonah's curse works even though the Jonah takes no actual part. Oh, he was an odd one, that Moran. For instance, the time Spark's selenium plate blew out, it was Moran who got permission to use the machine shop, construct a substitute out of urinoid steel, atom chamber. We used that freak audio throughout the trip, then replaced it with the standard one when we reached Earth. Like dopes, because two years later that screwball first made of the Saturn invented a uranium time speech trap. Exactly like the one Moran had made us. He earned a quarter million credits from it. Imagine. Then there was the time, as we were approaching the lunar outpost, that our calculating machine jammed. Lieutenant Bartlett and Cap McNeely were in a dither trying to figure out the approach velocity. It's a 15-minute job for the machine, a six-hour job for a man's brain. But Moran, who happened by, glanced casually at the declination chart, said, Cut to 43 at 3.05 Earth Standard, Captain. Maintain full speed for 0.35 parsecs. Alter declension to north 1, loft 7. Fire four jets twice. Having no better idea, McNeely did, as Moran suggested. And we warped past the moon, O-O trajectory, which put us within scant hours of Earth's H-layer, and which also roused to me the realization that the mysterious Paul Moran was more than the ordinary space sailor he pretended to be. Maybe I'm Snoopy. I don't know. Anyway, I went into the radio room. I told Sparks grimly, You and I are going to find out just who this Moran guy is. Send a message, Sparks, to Fred Bender at Long Island Spaceport. Tell him to find out if there's a scientist missing who answers this description. Five feet, seven and a half inches, 125 pounds, dark hair, brown eyes. The relay of that description and the subsequent reply took longer than I had anticipated. That's why Sparks and I were among the last to learn of the new trouble. We didn't learn until, excited, we burst onto the bridge, confronted the skipper with our information. Look, skipper, I yelled. No wonder Moran was able to fix Sparks radio and set your course. Do you? And the captain raised haggard eyes to me. Great, where have you been? I've been autoing all over the ship for you. In Sparks' cabin, listen though, Moran is... I don't care, said the skipper wearily, who he is. In a little while, nobody else will either. Your checkup, Mr. Bray, was a miserable failure. We are only an hour and a half out of the H-layer, and the shield generators refuse to function. I just stared at him for a minute. When I caught my breath, there was only enough for one word. Impossible. Impossible, maybe, acknowledged the first mate. But unfortunately, Don, the captain's right. Three lead-in cables are broken. The striping is off the condenser. But everything was in perfect order an hour ago. I don't understand. Yes, I do, Moran. He said he'd destroy us all if he got a chance. Skipper, there's the answer. He's done it. The madman. Then there was a mirthful chuckle in the doorway, and Moran was standing there looking at us, his thin lips wide in a smile. You're right, Brate. I did do it. But I'm not a madman. I'm a happy man. The happiest man who's ever lived. His eyes lighted triumphantly. He stretched his arms above his head in a great, yearning gesture. Soon will come freedom. The great, everlasting freedom of death. Get him! said the skipper succinctly. Gunner McCoy lumbered forward. His long, hairy arms encircled Moran's body. The skipper pawed his gray thatch. This is no time for reproaches, Mr. Brate. I told you to guard this man. For some reason you failed to do so. But now our problem is to repair the damage he has done, or else. His pause was significant, but Moran's quiet mocking laughter persisted. It's useless, Captain. Not in hours. No, not in weeks. Will you repair the damage? Don't you see? There was a feverish light in his eyes, a shuddering vibrance in his voice. Don't you see that I bring you the greatest of all boons known to man? Death! Wonderful, blissful death. Death that I have sought so long, so hopelessly. Those were the last words I heard for some time. I dashed from the room. Bartlett, Sparks, and McCoy at my heels. We picked up the chief engineer. We covered the Antigon from stern to stern. And our worst fears were realized. It was no use. The damage Moran had done was irreparable. Russ Bartlett said, There's only one way out. We mustn't try to penetrate the heavy side layer. We must shift trajectory past Earth and remain in space until we get the shield generator operating again. And Chief Lester said somberly, Have you forgotten the trajectory you planned, Lieutenant Bartlett? The trajectory? I thought it was unusual, rumbled the engineer, when you called it down to me. 
It's a paper-thin balance on a knife's edge between counter-gravitations. If we try to shift our course now, we'll tear the ship into shreds. I knew now why Moran had come up with such a ready answer when the computer failed. He had planned well. He had deliberately forced us into this trajectory from which there was no escape. Back on the bridge, we found Captain McNeely pacing the deck like a caged cat. Moran was silent, watchful, intent, with an unholy gleam of justification lighting his curious eyes. The skipper looked up, hopeful as we entered. Well, gentlemen, Bartlett shook his head. McNeely was silent for a long moment. His glance roved the smart, glistening interior of the Antigon's control room. I knew exactly what he was thinking. It was too bad that this smooth perfection, this finest ship built by master craftsmen, should become a brief, winking flame in the atmospheric borders of Earth. And it was tough that we must all go out like this together, through no fault of our own, through the machination of a space-mad castaway. He turned to me. Lieutenant Brait, you and Sparks will go to the radio turret. Send a complete report to the Earth authorities. Tell them, he gulped, tell them why the Antigon will not come in. I said, aye, aye, sir, mechanically and started for the door. But Sparks stopped me. Ain't you going to tell him what we learned, eh? About him, he jicked his head toward Moran. Doesn't really make any difference now, I said, but I suppose. My voice was scornful. There was scorn and bitterness in my heart. They might as well know that the man who has condemned us all to death is, or was, one of Earth's greatest scientists. Had he not become a raving lunatic, his genius could have stemmed this disaster. McNeely said, What's that, Lieutenant? What do you mean? I mean, this man's name is not Paul Moran. Names, murmured Moran gently. What difference does a name make when one has had thousands of names? His name, I continued, is John Cartophilus. Bartlett said, Cartophilus? In a leap, he was at our strange guest's side, his voice eager. Then he will. He must. Help us. Cartophilus, listen to me. Of all men, only you have the genius of devising some way of escaping this peril. You've been mad, sir, insane from your privations. But now I beg that you cast aside this madness. Come to our rescue. Moran, or Cartophilus, brushed his hand aside. A dreamy look was in his eyes. Death, at last, he whispered. Oh, sweet boon of mankind, death. I have suffered so long, waited such a long time. Can't you hear me, man? Snap out of it. Time is growing short. In half an hour, maybe less, we'll nose into the h layer, and then... Please, sir. But there was no reply. Captain McNeely looked at me uncertainly. Are you sure, Brate? Positive. I forwarded a description to Bender at L.I. He said, Cartophilus has been missing for a year and a half. He fled Earth because of a scandal, it seems. Never mind that now. McNeely confronted the insane scientist. Mr. Cartophilus, you must help us out of this jam. We're not thinking only of ourselves, but of the mothers and children waiting for us on Earth, and the future of space travel. If the Antigon, the finest ship ever built, blows out in the h layer, it will strike a heavy blow to all astronavigation. Help us, sir, for heaven's sakes. Cartophilus spoke sharply. Don't say that! Only heaven can save us now, said McNeely simply. If you won't, it's our only hope. May the Lord help us if you... Don't! The strange, thin man screamed the word. Suddenly he buried his face in his hands, and his words were an incoherent babble of torment. Don't you see what you're doing? Man, have you no pity? He raised wide, tortured eyes. The endlessness of time, he whispered. But I thought that, free of earth, lost in the depths of space, I might at least find peace. But now you call upon me to save you in his name. I won't do it. I won't. The power cannot force me here in the void. Two thousand years... No, no. McNeely stepped back, torn between dread and doubt. He shook his head at us. It's no use. He's completely mad. Then Rest Bartlett cried. Wait, listen. For Cartophilus, his face worn and aged, had bowed his head as though surrendering to forces greater than his will to die, and he was droning in a drab, lackluster voice. Tell the engineer to reverse the polarity of the alternate hypotomic motors. Transmit the counter-electromagnetic force helically through the forward coils. Use full power. Keep all motors running at top speed. Cut out the inner communications and lighting system. There must be no DC current in operation anywhere on the ship. The cross-currents will, 
Chief Engineer Lester's face was a mask of blank dismay. He asked, A hysterosteris block. It might work. Nobody's ever thought of that before. What do you mean? That was Captain McTeeley. His suggestion. Heterodyning the web coils so we'll counter the H-layer radiation with an alternating current of our own. It's just about one chance in a million. Then take that chance, cried the skipper. Try it. Do as he says, and for God's sake, man, hurry. Cartophilus, his eyes drained of all expression, rose sluggishly. Once more he spoke faintly. It will work, he said. It will work, and I have failed again. And all because I would not let him rest. His voice broke into a great retching sob. Then he lurched from the control room like a broken thing. I never saw him again. No one aboard the Anticon ever saw him again. For the next hour we were in a turmoil. Rearranging the electrical units of the ship as Cartophilus had told us, we finished our task just in time. Scant seconds after we had thrown on the power, we nosed into the web-like fields of the force, which is the h layer. It was a breathless moment. Despite our efforts, there was not a man of us but expected a brief, brilliant instant of horror, then oblivion. But we were as wrong as Cartophilus had been right. There was a jolt as our force field met that of Earth's shield. Perma-alloy hull of the ship sang and hummed and glowed cherry red under the impact of that terrific electromotive strain. But we slipped through the barrier with greater ease than ever had any ship using the old-style shield generators. In our jubilation, we quite forgot the mad scientist whose strange, last-minute change of mind had saved our lives. We landed, and sometime between the moment of landing and the moment when we remembered our passenger, he fled, disappeared completely from the ship and from our lives. McNeely was nothing if not a square shooter. He refused to take credit for the invention that had brought us through the h layer. The patent rights were taken out in the name of our deranged passenger. The Moran H-Penetrator, it's called. All spaceships used it. Until just recently, until Cap Hawkins of the Andromeda and the Venetian scientist J. Fargos discovered Ampes could be used as h layer shields. But afterward, Captain McNeely came to me wondering, why should he have wanted to die, Brait? I don't understand it. A man like John Cartophilus, wealthy, intelligent, respected. Was he really mad, do you think? I hesitated. I, too, had been wondering about that. I had gone so far as to look up the life history of the mad scientist. I found several curious things. No man knew when or where John Cartophilus had been born. All agreed that he was remarkably youthful in appearance. It was rumored that he had outlived a wife married in youth, and that she had been an elderly woman when she died. I said, I told you there had been a scandal in his life recently, Skipper. It concerned a friend of his, a worker in one of his shops. Carter Phillips was, and is, a genius, but he has a reputation for driving his men too hard. They say that on this occurrence, seeking the answer to some problem that invaded him, he forced his assistant to labor for weeks, begrudging him even a few hours sleep each night. On the eve of the solution to the problem, this worker came to him, nervous, ragged, exhausted, begging for a brief respite, claimed he was sick with overwork and fatigue. But John Cartophilus insisted, impatiently, that there was no time for rest. He ordered the man to get about his work. The job was completed, but the friend died. The doctor said it was a pure case of exhaustion. When he heard this, Cartophilus's brain snapped. He blamed himself for the man's death, fled Earth, became, or so we believe, the wandering spaceman we found in the asteroids. Captain McNeely frowned. Do you believe that story, Bright? I started to say no. I started to tell the skipper something else I had discovered while probing into the life history of John Cartophilus. Something that, to my mind at least, more fully explained the oddness of our erstwhile passenger. It was an old legend I had run across. The queer story of a man with many names. I have had so many names, Moran had said, who wandered endlessly about the earth, perhaps the universe now, simply because he had not let another rest for a moment at his door sill. Sometimes this man had been known as Cartphilus. He had also been known as Juan Esperado and De Zoe, Ahasuerus, and as Budadus. The Parisian Gazette, Turkey spy, had in 1644 A.D. reported his presence in the city traveling under the name of Paul Marien. But men in general knew him by a more descriptive name, the Wandering Jew, the Eternal Jew. But I did not tell Captain McNeely this. After all, it was a fanciful thought. And surely Moran, or Moraine, or Carter Phillips was mad when he claimed to have met and talked with Simon Magnus 1,200 years ago. Anyway, when we saw that ad in the classified column of this week's Space Weeklies, 
and McNeil claimed Moran would return to claim his reward, it raised a question in my mind. Will he return, or will he find at last whatever peace awaits him out there, in the vast emptiness of space, where the power cannot, must not extend? I wonder. End of The Castaway by Nelson S. Bond